This is the Better Decisions Podcast. My name is David Siddons. I am the uh, host of the show. And today I have with me Eli Braha. It's my best uh, pronunciation of your, your name. You did well. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. So Eli, uh, we have a great uh, working relationship. Eli is an expert. I'm going to let him introduce himself. But this podcast as we are in March 2024, is going to revolve around, most importantly for those watching, the realities of the real estate market in Miami this year, what are the forces at play, and working in our predictions as we put out our 2024 forecast predictions report, which went out a few weeks ago, we're going to address the forces at play in our market today with the help of an expert and hopefully explain a little bit in, in greater detail what's happening and why it's happening, and obviously, what's going to happen next. Ellie, thank you for joining me. Um, please introduce yourself once more for those that don't know, in you know full glory of what you do and, and the context of which you do it. All right. Well, thank you, David, for having me. So yes, for those of you who do not, that do not know me, so I'm a real estate professor at Florida International University. I'm also the director of the Hollow School of Real Estate at Florida International University. So my, my PhD is basically in the area of real estate and real estate investments, and also the co-founder of the Baracha team, which is a real estate consulting firm, brokerage, um, wealth management, and, and the like. So that's, that's what I do. A little so, bit of everything. Yeah. A lot of things, but with a great amount of detail. And the one thing that we take a lot of pride in in what we do is there is a real-world application to what we do, and there's obviously an academic study understanding uh, what's happening because sometimes I think it's very easy in the business to just go around our everyday life certainly as a broker just to go selling real estate having fun you know showing nice properties without really studying the forces at play and I think that's really important especially now now more than ever 2024 is a real um I say it's an inflection point. There's a, there's a, a moment of change, but there's it's very important to understand that change that's occurred, so no one starts freaking out because that can happen a lot. Um, I wanted to start with obviously some of the ugly truths. Um, we this is not a sycophantic podcast. We're not here to talk about how um, how amazing everything is in Miami and why sh everyone should move here and why it's the best place to be and and why it's the fastest growing city in America and all these companies that are moving here because we've. We've had that conversation before. Everyone's had that conversation before multiple times. What, what I want to hear from you is what you're seeing in the market right now. Um, and then we're going to dive a little deeper into some of the, let's call them the negatives, but some of the things to be really aware of in the decision-making process, buying or selling um, in Miami today. And I guess Fort Lauderdale in South Miami in general. So um, what are, what are you, how do you summarize what we're seeing in the market right now? So I think the, the first thing that people are experiencing is the fact that the market in Miami, well, all over the country, but specifically here in Miami, it went up in terms of pricing very quickly over a very short period of time. And every time that you see something like that, this sharp increase in prices, the market just needs a breather. And a breather doesn't mean that the market is going to correct necessarily. And a lot of people yep. are waiting for a correction and say, well, market, let's say, doubled over the last three years or so, depends on which area you're looking at. Yep. But, that's, but that's roughly true. So let's wait for price to come down, and then I'm going to be buying again. So a lot of people are basically now taking a breathing, pausing, and waiting for what's happening next. Um, and that is natural. So if you see, for example, price rising in 2000 and you know, all the way until 2007. So that's the last peak we had in the market uh, before the, the Great Recession. Uh, there was a lot of reasons of why, you know, the music stopped. There's no support for pricing at that time, meaning rent were not catching up to prices. Uh, a lot of purchases with zero down, et cetera. And uh, people were right by, you know, stop buying, the market collapsed, and then they picked up again, uh, buying again. Today, the situation is very different. So the market does need a breather, but the fundamentals are there. The economy overall is strong, is robust. Uh, interest rates, even though they're not as low as people want them to be, they're still relatively low, and they will come probably lower over the next uh, few months. Uh, probably not as much as people would like them to, but a little bit lower. Um, but the market just needs time to process, and I think it's a very natural uh, time. <sighs> There's just a lot of buyers there that are not willing to pay those prices. It just didn't, 
they're mm -hmm. not comprehending those new prices and say, hey, yeah. something that now costs two used to cost one, one, let me just wait. And a lot of sellers that are saying, well, even if I'm selling it for two, what else can I buy? So yeah. the resistance from buyers don't want to buy. Sellers not really jumping to sell. And that's creating just this period of not much happening. Yeah, that, that, that for this time being on the ground selling, I had a few people that would come to me and they would say, I'm waiting for a crash. I'm waiting to see, you know, I'm looking for, a, and this was a, a quote, I'm looking for a deal. And the deal suggests that someone's going to be under distress. In order to buy from them, you've got to deal with somebody who needs to sell, has to sell. And this is one of the things that um, I guess because people's recollection of what happened in 2007, 2008, they assume that when markets move up really, really aggressively, there has to be some kind of systemic correction into the market. Um, but it's been put out there and, and documented. And again, we've got a lot of da uh, data screens to add into this, um, into this podcast um, that show that Miami as a city is very different than what it was 20 years ago or 18 years ago, whatever it was. It, it's really a different uh, set of rules that we're operating under. Um, you get a lot of the commercial data, a lot of the information that, that we can cover and look into. And I want to kind of look at sometimes the bigger picture gets lost when people get so focused on things. And, and again, we're naturally pulled into, pay attention to various different things in front of us. So we've got major inflection points happening with, we've got the election, we've got uh, higher interest rates, you've got pent up demand, and you've got um, uh, what some people might argue in certain areas as lack of inventory, but probably better yet, lack of affordable quality inventory is maybe a better way of phrasing it. Um, we'll come to that in a bit. But when we look at Miami as a city, and again, you, you know, you do these studies, and again, at FIU, one of the, the sides is, let's not, let's not lose sight of, of the big engine here at play. What are we seeing within Miami? Because you've, you've shown me with a number of these tables, and again, we can go into them, um, what, uh, what we're seeing in terms of trends. I mean, let's start with the, the actual income levels that we're seeing through Miami. That's something that's, that's been raised. And when, what number one for the, the highest income level increase in, um, in the country? Okay, David, so, so this is important. So first of all, I, I can talk about this income, but you're talking about trends in the market. And I think it's very important to realize that the residential market, so for owner-occupied homes, is very different than the commercial market. Yeah. And the reason this is so different, it's because on the owner-occupied home, there's no pressure for um, owners to sell. Yes. Okay? They can hold, actually, there's a pressure for them not to sell because they own those mortgages that are very low, and, you know, we know the story basically. Well, I have a 3.5% mortgage. If I sell and buy something else, I need to take a mortgage that is 6.5% or 7%. Why would I do that? I need to have a very good reason to do that. So they're actually holding from selling. Uh, and that's give a lot of stability to the market. On the commercial side, it's very different. Those mortgages are not 30-year fixed. It's extremely rare to have those mortgages. Typically, they are five years interest only with some fixed rate. And then you have to refinance. So th the overall commercial landscape is one that, by virtue, if I'm hearing you right, by virtue of what's going on with the lending and, and the loans coming to fruition, it's going to soften a little bit. Long term, though, within Miami, again, we started to have this conversation in the past over the new companies moving here. And I think that there was so much in the media over it about Citadel and all these companies that everyone was expecting like this overnight population explosion. But the fact is, is that these offices still have to be built. They're in the process of being built. So you're not going to get an immediate effect. And I think that sometimes, and I see this on the residential side, translating to what I'm seeing in that sector, I see sellers saying, well, I'm going to have my place at a really, really high number because I'm going to wait for that Citadel guy or gal to come in and buy my home and they've got so much money it doesn't care and there's so much population wealth that's come into the city that I can get away. I might be able to get away with this. That doesn't seem to be the case well, statistically. It, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's not the case yet because a lot of those companies that are moving here or make the decision to move, uh, either they haven't or they just started, so it's starting with small numbers. Yeah. So you will see the effect over the next 
you know, three to four years of a lot of those companies that said, okay, we're moving, but it takes them some time to yeah. build their headquarters, to move enough people, and to really move the needles in terms of demand. So that's one of the good things we have here in Miami, that even if we are overbuilt for a little bit, or even if we have some headwinds in terms of interest rates or uh, pricing, we can grow into that. If the same thing happen in a, you know, non-growing city in the Midwest, for example, if you overbuild in Topeka, Kansas, for example, and I'm just picking up a, a city, and that city doesn't necessarily grow, then you have a problem for a very long period of time. If you overbuild in a city like Miami, and I don't think we're overbuilt, I think really it's going back to this market move up too fast, but, but even if you do overbuild, um, you can grow into that within a year, two, maybe three, depends how much you overbuild. And, and I don't think we're overbuilt. Um, I think we have a lot of certain products on the market, uh, specifically, we can talk about it later, but specifically uh, maybe on the luxury condominium that probably be uh, bought maybe later by some of those uh, city-like employees that uh, would like to, to live in a break area or, or condos yeah. in the area. Uh, but there's a lot of product that we just don't have enough and we'll never have enough. Yeah, there's a big picture to be seen. I, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll, I'll make a comment on, I mean, again, you know, you're, you're in brick a lot of the time because that's where, you know, um, the uh, the Hollow School of Real Estate has its its headquarters. Yeah. Um, the Brickle Market is an interesting one because obviously it's the biggest, it's the urban core for Miami. It's it's the highest, most densely populated part of the city. And you know, obviously, when we see the cycles through Miami, there's always a picture of Brickle, and it always announces, you know, here's the next stack of condos that are going to be here for 2030, or or I remember the last cycle, 2020. And there's always this expectation of you're going to build like crazy, you're going to build too much, it's not going to get absorbed. Um, right now, one of the things I'm noticing is that we still don't have a lot of ultra luxury product to serve that market. And the the new construction sales at the luxury sector have actually done really, really well. I'm kind of, I've been curious to see how through the first quarter of this year, for example, in Brickle, they had the announcement of the Mandarin project on Brickle Key. That is an ultra, ultra luxury condo. And I think the most ultra luxury condo that Brickle will see for a very long time. And although it's not, you know, officially they don't have their sales, proper sales center open until May. Um, I've been selling a lot of units in that project. And I want to say it's not going to be probably more than another month or two before they're halfway reserved or sold out of the 220 units that they have. Um, and, well, and also people need to realize that people say, you know, they say Brickle. But I need to realize that, you know, in Brickle, there is very different kind of product. So the older product yeah. that is, is a little bit more affordable, you cannot compete or it doesn't compete. It's not the same kind of client as the, the client that buy the Mandarin. Yeah. So um, the, the people that buy in the Mandarin, those people that choose to buy, it's not their first home. It's probably their second, third, fourth. Uh, and they really have choice and they buy it because whatever it is they see there, whether they see value or luxury or it just fit for them as the, the second or third home. But the people that buy different product in Brickle, especially the buildings that are, you know, 20, maybe 30 years old, uh, those are people that buy out of necessity. They just need a place to live. They have, they're doing okay. Uh, and that product is acting very differently. You cannot build more of that product. You cannot build more of a 20, 25-year-old building. Definitely, <clears throat> you can do it because, okay, if you build it, it's brand new. That's by definition. But forget about that. The, if you build something brand new, the price of that project is by definition, simply because of construction costs, it's going to be a lot higher. Mm -hmm. So anything that you build new is not really competing with the inventory of the buildings that are 20 years old or 25 years old. So uh, the whole idea of, okay, we have all this inventory, you're literally looking at very, very different kind of buyers. Um, and, and if you have a good product that is 20-some year old and it's relatively affordable, I think you're going to do fine. So there are... That granted, with Miami, have an enormous array of product and price points, and we'll go into that. There's many different price points that we've looked at and studied, and it's incredible to see how the speed of transactions, the product that's moving and not moving, and also the expectation of the sellers. The expectation of the sellers is very varied across different price points. Unsurprisingly, at the very top end, um, sellers are still asking very, very high numbers relative to what was previously sold. Um, the the dangers and the, and the real estate paradox that we're dealing with this year that we are wondering how that's going to play out is, as you 
said, and everyone's been saying many, many times, sellers who don't need to sell, buyers who don't need to buy. When does that start to shift? And, and, uh, and what's the triggers that will create that, that systematic change, if there is any systematic change to I be had? I think it's time. Uh, there's really no trigger in a sense, because I, I think when people wait for something to happen, there's only so long they can wait. They say, you know what, we're waiting for price to come down. And then it does, the prices do not come down for a quarter, two, three quarters, a year, two years. Eventually, they want to move on, okay? Uh, especially if there are people that are renting and they see rent that is sticky and going up and they get this, this rent renewal and say, oh, now instead of 4000 need to pay 4500 or whatever the price is and give it a little more urgency to act. Or if people just want a place and they said, you know what, I want to get a deal. And after a while, they're realizing, well, the deal is not coming. I might as well just, you know, move on. Um, and, and in terms of pricing, again, the different kind of buyers, it's, it's very important to distinguish. So there is this nonlinear relationship between, you know, what you buy and where the wealth is. And what, what I mean by that is that, you know, you have this, this less expensive product, and we can talk brick or any other area, that's selling for, I don't know, uh, 400, 500, 600 or a foot, Okay. And then it goes to 800 to 1,000 a foot. And then from there, it's already jumped to 1,500, 2,000, and then anything above that. And the reason for that, and sometimes you look at, okay, so the product for 2,000 versus 500 a foot, yes, it's different, but really, does it justify? And, and maybe, maybe not, depends on you know, your opinion. But the point is that the people that are demanding these 2,000 square foot, they make money out of wealth. They're not working for the income, right? They're basically generating... Their, their income from wealth, and wealth is growing exponentially. So the difference between 2,000 a foot and 3,000 a foot for them is the same as for somebody else between you know, 300 and maybe 400 a foot. Uh, and, and that's why you see those... What so you're saying there's less... What, what we observe in studies is there's less price sensitivity to pay a higher dollar per square foot if the product is right for them and it's what they want. On the high end. On okay. the high end, for it's, sure. That's interesting because I think that's maybe the psychology, and I've seen it with sellers in the market, um, especially at the high end, who have said, well, it's special. And if someone comes in and sees this, they're going to recognize this. If, and if they want it, they're going to be willing to pay for it. The difference between someone paying, you know, 3000 or 4000 isn't that much of a big deal. To a degree, I can agree with you. I have seen that. I have seen buyers come into the market and they look at stuff and say, well, I've got a range. If, it, if it's, I had a conversation last night with someone and they said, you know, what I'd like to spend is three and a half to four million dollars. But if I find something really special, I'll pay six. You know, and that's a 50 percent jump. Yeah. That's a big jump in their numbers. Obviously, once you get to the high level, we're seeing things exaggerate even more. What's interesting now in the new construction area is that the dollar per square foot remain very, very much higher than the resale product in the market. So I'm seeing dollar per square foot of so new product like in Brickle, for example, almost all the new product that's coming out of the gate is all floating in the high $1,800 to $2,200 a square foot range. But the resale product is still floating around $800 to $1,000 a square and foot. And it's not very different. It's, I love that older product is basically the same as the new product, except it's 10, 15, 20, yeah, except it's not brand yeah. new. Uh, and a lot of people are recognizing that. So again, the, the fact that you can have as many supply, new supply as, as, as you want, you cannot create more supply of the affordable or more affordable portion. Of the well, there's also something to be said as well. One of the things that also occurred was, and I've seen with a number of buyers, and we've documented this on our, on our predictions and, and forecast, is how there's a lot of money in the sidelines. There's a lot of money still floating around. People, what we call the pent-up demand. The pent-up demand is there. Showings are happening I think me and my team were carrying close to 40 listings right now. And we show every single day. I mean, there's so many showings, but it's interesting to see that there's still buyer hesitation. And, and I think that period of adjustment for them psychologically to come over and say, well, okay, this waiting is not getting me anywhere. I think it's time to actually do something about it. Um, but then obviously, as we look through, you start to see... Um, the right product will start to move again. Things will start to get going. And, and they already are. But the buyers of the new product are not thinking about interest rates. They're not interest rate dependent. They're looking at things and saying, well, I think this is a three or four year long-term view. And I think what, what you've been saying, which is the same psychology everyone can appreciate, 
is if you look at the growth of Miami, if you look at the population growth, if you look at the business growth, if you look even at, at in the commercial behavior long term, you know, six million square feet of Class A office being built in, uh, in Brickell right now, that long term view can mm-hmm. only lead to increases in value, systemic increases of value once we take this little pause, little breather. And, and in terms of, of triggers, so people that don't have to buy right now, and they're basically looking for an excuse of why, you know, what would push them to buy. So it's going to be the new year. And we saw a bit more activity starting, you know, 2024 than we had in the end of 2023. It can be, well, when interest rates started to come down, they started to come down 2023, then they bounced back a bit. They're probably going to start coming down a little bit more toward the end of this year again. Uh, it can be elections. It can be any of those reasons people are just basically looking for something. Let's talk about the psychology of elections. That's yeah. an interesting one because the psychology of elections, and I remember last, last election and the election before that when, when, uh, when Trump got in, I remember there was a period of time when we were out showing real estate and people were so transfixed and glued to the TV. And as we get closer to the period of the election, so the media ramps up and everyone gets sucked in to this circus that goes on and they get so obsessed with it they just don't do anything it's almost like they get paralyzed by the media which is what they're trying to do in the first place i think i think this is this is exactly true a lot of people say well i'm not gonna buy before the election i'm gonna wait for after it and and really regardless the outcome you know whether it's the party that you voted for or not that is, is winning the election uh people just basically check elections over let's move on, whether it is again their their favorite party or not, uh, it's just one of those one of the things that people just because people say that they say okay let's wait after the election. But it doesn't it's actually make any sense. No reason because yeah. you know at the end of the day, yes, I mean different parties are you know they have different policies and you know over the long term, of course, they're going to move the country in a different direction. Depends whether it's Republican or Democrat. But at the end of the day, you know the economy is uh, it, it is what it is. And um, the fact that if you're acting a month before the election or a month after the election, it doesn't really make a difference. Unless you say, you know what, only if party X is winning that I'm buying and you really have a really good reason to do that, then that's fine. But I don't think that's what it is. I think most people just say, I want to buy after the election. Or they're not going to say, I'm going to buy after the election only if party X is yeah. winning. So uh, I think it's an excuse. I think it's a, a Basically, again, another way for people to just process the information, digest those higher new prices, and then move on. Um, people have very short memory. They're still remembering prices that used to be in place two years ago. But in a year from now, they're not going to remember those as much. Yeah. So the new reference points is changing. When prices are rising to a certain level, they stay there for a while. That becomes do you think that's going to have a good impact? Because I still get that psychologically. There's a big psychology play in the market, good and bad happening in either direction. But there's definitely a huge psychology play now more than I've seen before where buyers still look at prices. They still go to zero and they look at two years ago or three years ago. And they love to say, but this was 100% more expensive than what this guy paid three years ago. And I think if the numbers stabilize for another year, they're not going to bounce up. But if they're stabilizing for the next year, another year goes by and they're like, well, they were same last year. So that drop that we thought was going to happen, it didn't happen, didn't come. So now I just got to get on and live my life. I think people that are waiting for a collapse are just, just they will keep waiting. I just think they're stupid. Uh, I mean, I got I to be honest with you. I just think they're stupid. I, I This honest thing of I, I got to call it what it is. Look, you might not like what I say. It can be unfiltered. And I think it, part, of the, part of the joy I have of, of doing this podcast is I get to say what the hell I like. And you can argue with me all day long. Please come if you think you're right. I, I, I really entertain positive dialogue done intelligently. Explain to me why a market could collapse. I, it, I just don't see it happening because the demand is far, far too present and the need to sell it's is not there. Not there. You know, there is no, like, I need a deal suggests that someone's distressed, right? Most of the sellers that I know in the market, almost all without exception, have very low interest rates. They, they bought, sometimes they, they bought with cash. Then they finance. They don't need to buy on finance. They actually could quite happily um, just do all cash. But they have a very, they're in a very good situation right now. 
and and they're not going to claim um, bankruptcy anytime soon. Then you're not going to see the foreclosures or the short sales or any of those things. And even if you do, market. it's a very small amount compared to the demand in the market. Yeah. Uh, I give you another another graph. I think about the, the dry powder in the market. It's specifically for commercial real estate, but it mirrors what happened in the owner occupied. So when we talk about dry powder, is that all those people that are waiting for a crush, so they basically have a lot of money. So if we look at this graph, basically. We have now, or, or late of 2023, which is the most recent data we have, the most dry powder that we have ever. That means more people are ready to catch whatever is going to happen in the market, any kind of correction, and buy this. And that's almost by definition is telling you that you're not going to have any kind of severe decline. Specifically, this graph is for commercial real estate, but it's the same thing for for residential. I mean except we don't have data because dry powder for residential or an occupied doesn't really exist by definition. But think about it. If you talk to so many people and say, I want a deal. Okay. And all those people are just waiting for the deal. And then when, let's say something happened in the market and all of a sudden properties drop by 5%. Those people that went for a deal, they didn't get anything. Now they're getting a 5% discount. They jump and they buy this. So they're going to be somebody who's going to be buying those at a small discount what it is today preventing the market from collapsing. So the, by definition, having all these people waiting for collapse is preventing a collapse. Yeah. You have just all this money waiting uh, and ready to catch whatever it is that that is inventory that's going to come around. So rather than dismissing all those people who say, you know, I'm looking for a deal or I want to get a better price, I decided to look into this. And I think this may be, may be a really big point of this podcast is to explain where that psychology comes from. So we dug into this and we actually went into, um, and this is, where, this is where academics and the understanding of the market meets real world data on the ground. Um, I actually went through the market and we looked at, and then knowing that Miami behaves differently, we went up to a million dollars, one million to three, three to five, five to 10, and 10 plus. And we viewed it in a way, we tried to explain it in a way that was kind of fun and engaging and made sense and everyone could relate to. So we thought, what would it be like if it was like a car traveling down the road at speed? What would the speed of the market be be like right now in 2024? So we used the process of looking at active with contract and pending deals against what's actually active for sale right now. So stuff that's in contract but not closed against things that are currently active in the market. And what we saw was we saw absolutely a definitive drop in the speed of the market. So as you go up in the price point, so things are moving slower. There's a, a, a lower level of transactions at a lower rate. Um, and then obviously we were factoring in things like what's changing that rate and, and, and where things are going psychologically on both the buying side and the selling side. I think that reason why buyers are like, I'm waiting, I'm pausing here, I'm hesitating, is because when they look on Zillow and everyone goes through Zillow and looks at things, they're seeing the number of transactions starting to drop in sectors. And a lot of that has to do with how it's being priced. Not to do with whether or not the product's desirable or people want to buy the product. Like I said before, lots of people are out there seeing properties and, and they're looking every single day. They're just not seeing the, the right price. So they're not pulling the trigger. But they want to buy. So we looked at this and, and, and up to a million dollars, which kind of <laughs> sounds obnoxious these I days. I know, it's, it's used to be. And, and the fact that you started with the lowest know, brackets below a million. You know, I talk to now people in the real estate agents, et cetera. And they say, well, the affordable product, you know, the one below a million. And I'm looking at them like, well, 950,000 is not necessarily affordable, but uh, we came to that, you know. Pro that product under there. a million works really well. You know, I, I was with you yesterday at the, the FIU board meeting. And so the members of the board come together and this is it's a great, uh, it's an absolutely incredible experience because you've got real estate professionals from all through South Florida coming together, putting our minds together and looking at things respectively um, from our viewpoint and everyone else's viewpoint, trying to make sense of what's going on. And um, actually one of the, the, the gents there said, you know, I, I had a, a condo in Brickell and I put it on the market for because um, he was asking me, how's the market doing? I said, well, it was a little slower in certain areas. He goes, well, that's funny because I put my property on the market at 985000 and it sold like that. I know exactly. And I sold it I for exactly above market. Talk to, yeah. Okay. So what was fascinating was, well, I said, well, of course, it was under a million dollars. It was a two-bedroom unit in yeah. Brickell Heights, yeah. 
and he sold it very, very quickly. The reality is, and again, statistically, right now there was 800 and se- there's 870 pending um, and active with contract properties up to a million dollars um, in the market right now that are, they're gonna, that are going to close. Um, weirdly enough, there's only 38 houses. So fortunately, there's a lot of there's still a good amount of condo product under a million dollars, but it's moving really, really well because it's it's uh, an easy price to get into, and there's not always I, enough. I think of it's it. very important. It's it's again a lot of that is depends on you know who is buying. So of course, the person is buying below a million, and the person is buying above ten million. It's a very different type of person. The one that's buying under a million, it can be somebody who maybe it's the first home, maybe second home. Uh, meaning second home, I'm not saying as their second residence, but the second time they buy a home. Um, and a lot of those people, they basically say, well, if I'm not buying now, I don't know, Miami is very hot. I don't know if I can afford to buy the place that I want in three, four years ago. And that is what happened to a lot of people that were waiting, you know, people waiting since 2009 for prices to drop. Oh, 2009, we didn't have money. Price were low. 2012 come around. Okay, price now are higher, but I'm waiting for a correction and then I'll buy again. And they've been waiting now for you know, yeah. 12 years. And now they're out. Those are the ones who maybe at the time said, maybe I'll get something for half a million dollars. And then half a million dollars wasn't affordable. Now it's exactly. to a million. Another five years from now, it so, could be two. So these people that buy under a million, a lot of them are under pressure or maybe under a fear that if I don't buy now, I will never be able to afford yeah. what I want. Especially if it's a single family home, those not going to exist, yeah. you know, in the price range. Being priced home. out of the market is a very real phenomenon as we see population replacement happening at, uh, on scale through South Florida income levels being much higher than they and were. The, and the guy that is buying above 10 million is not afraid of this. They already have the residence probably yep. already in Miami. They know they have a place to be that is nice, that are comfortable, whatever it is. They just maybe want something different or maybe something nicer, but they don't have to have it. If prices skyrocket and it becomes more difficult for them to get that product, so be it. They're not being priced out. They're just going to stay with whatever product they already have. So, uh, and that's and that's why the under million is, is traveling at a speed that is a lot higher. So let's move into that next category, one to three. So we're documenting all these price points and seeing what's happening. Once we get to the one to three, the market is still moving very, very well. One to three, and again, single family homes, and I went through this Miami-Dade area. I just used it as a, as a, as a group set of a, an area as an example. There's 330 active listings in the market. There's 114 that are pending and active. With our kind of like fun calculation algorithm that I came up with, this car's this is a car that's traveling at 70 miles an hour. So it's moving at speed. It's got pace. It's really, really moving. Um, th- so that house market is at 70 miles an hour. The condo market is actually moving slower. The condo mo- market is moving at only 32 miles an hour. It's moving at a slower pace. So it's interesting to understand why that is moving. And out of those sales, 40% of them are in older buildings. So 40% of those one to three in are, older, are in older um, condos. Um, there's 1,558 active listings on the market. Um, so given the fact that I think the market's now moving a little slower is because, again, product isn't maybe as exciting um, as people thought it might be. Um, and again, this is where interest rates start to maybe start to have their play. Start and, to and there's the more down. urgency on the single family compared to condos because at the end of the day, you can build as many condos as you want, right? Yeah. Anywhere you see an, a, an acre, whether it's empty or whether it's an older building there, you can build, you know, 400 units. Yeah. Uh, you cannot build 400 yeah. you know, single family homes yeah. anywhere. Uh, or you, can, you have to build four here and two there and one there and 38 there if you have... It's, it's not large amounts. So I think the urgency of getting single family homes Absolutely. or duplexes is a lot higher than the For condos sure. because at the end of the day, you will have the condo supply. You're just going to be at a different price because of construction costs. The, and the migration phenomenon is really felt in the single family home market because when people are moving with kids, the, there aren't many rental home options out there. And I know, you know, I've got, we've got kids ourselves. You need space for them. You need a house, and 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 the rental numbers are still. Again, we didn't get to touch on that, but the rental numbers are still strong. They're still. Uh, uh, what are you seeing with the rental market? Is that still as it was before? Is there some more softening? The rental market is a little bit soft. Again, uh, the highest supply of multifamily uh, in the country and Miami was the highest in 2023, and will continue in terms of supply in 2024. That 
you know, high supply of new projects is not going to come down until 2025. So uh, basically, you, we saw rents basically double uh, during the pandemic and around that time. Uh, and then they're leveling off. They're basically down to maybe, sli- sorry, they, they, they're stable to even slightly down uh, in 2023, starting 2024. They're probably going to stay where they're at. If you're renting right now, you're probably not going to get a rent increase uh, next year or definitely not a significant one. Uh, and it's going to be until 2025, maybe even 2026 until you see another resurgence in prices. The, I'm going to assume that's predominantly the condo market. Yes. Now, single family home is different. And and again, even when you're talking about condos, and that's important because when single family homes are so expensive, then a lot of people say, well, I can't afford a single family home, so I'm going to get a condo, but I have kids. So what product do I want? Then the three bedrooms and above, which is very rare product, those are the ones that are now becoming boutiques. So take a lot of the buildings from the 2000s. Most of the product there is studio, one bedroom, two bedrooms, and then you have very few three bedrooms. These three bedrooms, you're going to see them that are becoming in a much higher demand because you're going to see the families that can't afford a single family home but have one or two children on a, because of that basically want or have to live in a condo, so a little bit more space. This is the product that is that there is enough on and it's, the, it's basically... A, a, a replacement for single. We've home. always been dry on building. on the 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 prior to not the new product, but the the previous generation generations of of condo product um, didn't service the three and four bedroom because there's unit no buys. need for that at that it time. Would. Yeah, I mean, what, tr- 2012 to 2015. Again, history doesn't repeat itself, but it definitely rhymes, and we learn our future from our past. When you look at 12 to 15, 2012 to 2015, there was a massive surge of South American money that came through into Miami and Broward and, and all throughout South Florida. But so much of it, I remember being in Brickle, coming into Brickle, coming from Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, South American countries, and they were buying investment properties, one and two bedroom units, and they were renting them out. And that was, that was the, the, the product of choice that was being produced en masse. So... Um, I get it, but now the the demographic has shifted. The profile shifted. It's not investors who are out there looking. It's these end users. And because these condos aren't big enough, that's why I think all the new condos that are being built are being built as three and four bedrooms. That's yeah. what they're doing in these other condos. And the reason is either for families that cannot afford a single family home, so they have a condo, or as an investor, you can get a three you can get three roommates basically to rent a three bedroom apartment and the, the, the rent is more digestible. Yeah. So that product is, is again different. So there's a lot of those nuances in the market because, you know, wh- when I say, when I meet people and I say, hey, what do you do? I'm a real estate professor. Oh, how is the market doing? I always smile. <laughs> Million answers to that question. Because there's so many, yes. So, well, th- this is what this reveals. I mean, it, when you get into markets and you understand them, you study them, you start to see these patterns and trends and you realize how different markets behave at different ends of the spectrum, which as we go through, and again, as we now continue on to the next price point, you start to see the speed start to change a little bit. So now you go from one to three, the markets obviously was at 70 miles an hour and 32 miles an hour. Now we move into the three to $5 million range, the speeds drop. Now the uh, housing market, you see the speed drop to 40 miles an hour. Um, 44 pending deals against 205 active listings. Why did that start to happen? Why do we start to see fewer sales? I think maybe it's, it's what you said before. It's starting to see the sellers who don't need to sell, the buyers who don't need to buy, and, and, and that's a working wealthy category where interest rates start to really play an impact. And I think when you're looking at the three, is it three to five million? You three to five, yeah. Three to five million, um, it becomes very unaffordable for people that work for their money, you know, even if you very, have a high paying job, yep. uh, that product is still becoming mostly unaffordable. Um, and. And, and it's below for the people that are r- truly wealthy and looking for the very special product. So that's kind of falling between the chairs. Uh, and I think that's probably why you have less we, use. We call that the the working wealthy category. I mean, when we dissect it. I mean, it can be two, you know, it can be two working professionals, maybe two doctors or uh, two working professionals that, that can afford this. But there aren't too many of those. I mean, yeah. to really have from, from, a, from a high paying yeah. job to be able to buy a $5 million home is it's difficult. Absolutely. Definitely with today's interest rates. 
and, and and that's where I think the interest rates start to come into mm. real play here. And then obviously factoring in taxes and insurance because inflation in the US is set at a certain number. But Miami inflation, that's a whole other ball game. Yeah. Anyone who's taken and gone out for dinner in the last couple of months will, will attest to the fact that dining out, entertaining is very expensive. Yeah. And uh, you know, you, you, you'll see this throughout Miami, you'll see the cost of living has gone up and that makes things challenging. The condo market, the condo market moves down to 26 miles now. So it's now slowed from 32 to 26, not a big drop, but it's a drop. Again, a slower market. Now we see a smaller percentage of the older buildings in play being sold. Why? Because you know there's less of them at that price point. And at that level, buyers will want a newer building. Given the choice, do you want an old building with very high HOAs or will you try to go for a newer building? You go for a newer building. It's, it's kind of obvious. Knowing that these problems are going to exasperate as we go on. You know, you get a big storm and then obviously those HOA fees are going to continuously move and you've got other issues to deal with. Plus that 25-year assessment, which is now the new norm, uh, where it was 40, now it's 25. When we move into the next category, the 5 to 10 and the 10 plus, that's when it gets really interesting. Um, and we led on top of this a very geographically specific study into... Um, a market that I deal with, which is Coconut Grove, Coral Gables, South Miami, High Pines, Ponce Davis, the primary single family markets. But in the five to 10 range, sales dropped to 34 pending deals right now against uh, uh, the, the landscape of 229 active listings. That brings our speed down to 22 miles an hour. So we just dropped from 70 miles an hour down to 22 miles an hour. Um, and the condo market slowed down to 18 miles an hour, 30 sales to a backdrop of 330, 313 active listings, which is 31 months of inventory. Again, asking you honestly, Ellie, as you're seeing this, this slowdown, again, how do you attest this slow, slow in speed? Really, it's the, this, this, the, the higher you go in a market, it become more of a product of choice. And uh, for people that are choosing, that they don't have to buy, they need to have a good reason. So either they need to say something very exciting, or they need to be convinced the market is really not dropping before they're committing. So they need, I think, to see the market that is stable, constant for a while before they say, you know what, I'm okay paying these prices yeah. because they're probably not going to come down. I mean, that, that's the way we get it. People aren't insane. I mean, generally speaking, they're pulling their information from somewhere. You just need to, you know, we always say, if you want a better answer, come up with a better question. Understanding why people's behavior is such uh, is not enough to just say, well, you know, they're uneducated. No, they're, they're seeing things, they're recognizing things themselves and saying, I'm going to make a call on this. If I don't see that many sales, I'm not going to be as bullish to go out there and buy a home when interest rates are high. Um, but that isn't necessarily the smart thing to do if you just want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you are a buyer and you're a long-term buyer, you have to recognize that you just need to pay the right price. And there's a lot of product that is priced right and there's a lot of product that is not. Yeah. So people, people kind of put everything together in the same basket and it's not true. Absolutely. And let me tell you, because you touched on inflation, you know, so, so the Fed is targeting 2% inflation because we had for a while inflation at 2% and actually below and we're waiting for inflation to go to the 2% or around that number and then the Fed will feel uh, more comfortable decreasing rates. Um, again, the world is different today. So there's Pre-COVID is post-COVID, and especially post-COVID, uh, there's a lot of pressure on the labor market from uh, just not having enough workers. Uh, part of that is uh, a lot of workers just went out of the, the, you know, the market in terms of willingness or or ability to work. Uh, immigration is a little bit uh, tighter, and we're going to have this continued pressure of you know even now when interest rates went up so quickly, we are basically at the one of the lowest unemployment levels ever. Uh, and if you ask anybody, if they would think, okay, so interest is going to go from basically zero to five and a half on the Fed fund rate over such a period of time for a relatively long period of time, what will happen to unemployment? And people will tell you, oh, it's going to explode. And it did not. It stayed very, very, very low. That trend is not going to stop anytime soon, meaning that you have a lot of demand for workers over the next few decades. It's not something that's for a year or two. Basically, this is the demographic you know, structure in the economy. And when you have a lot of demand on workers, especially labor with certain skills, that means they're going to get paid more and that higher pay is going to put pressure on inflation. So do not expect inflation to go to 1.5% stay there yeah. anytime soon. It's probably going to be very difficult to bring it to 2 
and the Fed is probably going to be at some point kind of uh, maybe even giving up and they're going to see two and a half percent they're going to be happy enough maybe decrease interest rate a bit to give more comfort on the other side of the economy which is the the lending and the investment side um but inflation is not going probably to be a, a below two percent anytime soon what it means for real estate because real estate is the biggest component of inflation that you're going to see this higher price appreciation on average over the, the long term uh than it was you know, before when inflation is one and a half percent versus inflation is two and a half percent, we know that real estate on average is appreciating around the rate of inflation. Uh, that should be structured and built into the pricing. And people don't see that. People just think that, okay, it was one and a half percent for a long time. We're going back there. I don't think we're going back there. So it's smarter to take a more long term view because sometimes we always see uh, Miami's always had oscillating cycles and and, and there's always buyers out there looking for the opportunity, which means they're looking for that sudden spike, that sudden movement. The realization is that if you can take more of a long-term view of the market, and particularly the Miami market right now with the way things are growing and developing, you're, you're going to be, um, it's going to be smart to put your money in real estate. Generally. I, again, I, again, I'm biased, but I think it's generally uh, the right assessment, of course, depends on the product, depends on the price. Uh, so you have to be very selective now. There, look, there's some times where you can buy anything and you'll do well. Yeah, that, so, for example, that's not, and that's not true now. If you bought anything in 2020, no matter what you bought, you did well, maybe with the exception of office. Anything you bought, you did well. Now, there's a lot of things that you can do well with, but you have to be a lot more selective, which is, I think, where advice is, is worth getting. Um, yeah, so just, just be more selective. That's, yeah. that's really my... And, that, and that, that leads me into, here's the warning. Here's the warning, folks, that I'm going to give you because as we go through into this data and then when we go into the $10 million plus range, speed drops even more. 22 miles an hour, 25 pending deals against 224, 16 miles an hour for the condo market, um, which is 10 sales against 113. But it gets way more interesting than that because it gets interesting in terms of what you should buy, what you should avoid when you start to look at some of the active product that's in the system and what some sellers are asking and in light of what's sold in the past. Um, and I'm not talking about what's sold in the past three years ago. I'm talking about transactions in the last six months. So if we look at transactions in the last six months, I took Coconut Grove, Coral Gables, High Pine South, Miami, Ponce Davis, and Pine Crest. But I decided to take those areas because those are the primary markets driven by migrating families moving in. And those are the, the markets where buyers are looking and saying, well, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of property, but I'm not pulling the trigger. So we saw a reduction since January in the 5 to 10 range and the 10 plus range of around tw both of them, 28% of the inventory was reduced in price. There were reductions made across 28% of those markets. It's actually quite a substantial amount of reductions. But even though those reductions were made, and here's the kicker, in the markets, in the waterfront market, two-thirds of the properties for sale are still asking a higher dollar per square foot than the record dollar per square foot in the last six months. In the dry lot market, in houses that are not on the water, we see product where, you know, out of 63 listings on the 10 million plus, 29 of them Basically, half of them are asking a higher dollar per square foot than the record has achieved in the market in the last six months. And, and those are, and this is exactly, these are, these are selective sellers. Basically, they say, you know what, I don't have to sell, but I'm going to price it high. And if I get a buyer, then I'll sell. And if not, I'm okay not selling. And, uh, and, and there's periods where you can have that. Um, and you really have to distinguish because you have those sellers that are unoccupied, they live in their own home, they don't have to sell, they say, you know what, I'm going to price it high, and if, it, if somebody likes it enough, it's special enough for them, they will buy it. Otherwise, I will just keep it. But then if you talk about developers, that's a whole different thing. So if you're a developer that build a $10 million product, and it sits for a month, two, three, six months, et cetera, and every month you have to make the interest payment, property tax, et cetera, and those payments can be you know 50000 a month or whatever it is, there's only so much you can wait until you have to be realistic with yourself and say, okay, what do I need to sell this product for it? Or what do I need to price this in order for it to sell? And when the developers are repricing, some of these product maybe is, is, is a little bit out of whack, then the other buyers will price accordingly. Because yeah. they say, okay, this brand new product sold for X number 
uh, of dollars per square feet and mine is not new, so I cannot ask, you know, 20% more, let's adjust it. And, and that's how the market works. There's just, it just takes time to process, especially in those markets, we don't see very many uh, transactions. And especially when every product is different than the other, right? It's different. And if I, if, if I, if I live in a building in, in Brickell, uh, and I have a two bedroom there and other units sold, let's say for 800 to 150, then I know I cannot ask for Milan because- There's so much repla yes. replaceable yeah. product like yeah. that. What I've noticed with, again, you talked about developers and, and builders. What I'm seeing now more than ever is that they're bringing their product to market much earlier than they ever used to. And they're, they're testing the market. They're, they are. They're testing the market. They're bringing it to the market, sometimes even before they've broken ground. They're just showing renderings of the property and they're asking a really, really crazy dollar per square foot because they're just fishing. I don't think they've got a real expectation of selling. And I think if you are a buyer coming into Miami and you're looking at some of these, you know, some of these renderings are really good. I mean, they look like photographs, so don't be tricked. They look amazing and they are hoping to get someone who will come in and get juiced up and they'll say, well, it's a brand new house and it's great and it's, you know, it's what I'm gonna buy. But what I'm seeing is that the numbers that they're asking don't marry. Don't be seduced by that because they're not real sellers. It's not until their shell is up and they're really going through the process when they're getting within six months of it being finished. Those are the guys who really you'll be able to buy, at, I think, closer or at fair market price. Before that, I just don't think you can. Um, and, the, and, the, and the statistics and the markets and the, and the realities show that. We have a number of properties in the market through this area that are asking dollar per square foot so much higher than what's sold before. And I'm talking stuff that should have been trading for around fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars a square foot and they're up at two thousand dollars a square foot. It's a 25% difference of what they really should be able to get. Um, and it doesn't marry, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I saw one house, 4,700 square feet, they wanted $10 million for this house. It made absolutely zero sense. So it doesn't surprise me that buyers will come in and see some of this stuff and say, well, that's just crazy. And, and, and then, then they systemically view the market much the same throughout and say, well, everything then has to come down. There is product that when it's priced right. If you're a real seller and you need to sell in the next six months or you want to sell this year and you really do want to sell, you're not just fishing the market, then I think you really need to pay attention to the transactions that actually occurred. And if on the other side of the coin you're a buyer and you're coming in and you're looking at product and you really want to buy this year and you are looking to pay the right number, don't throw everything out in the same hand and say, well, you know, um, I'm, I'm either going to you know, pay a new record price or I'm just not going to buy at all. I think there is a happy medium. We just need to separate the, the, the reality from, from the, uh, the make-believe that happens in the market. And that paradox will still exist. I mean, it's still existing now. I guess it'll probably have to correct a little bit. People's expectations will change. Obviously, you see some reductions. People are chipping away at those reductions. But they're still not getting close to reducing how much they need to. Otherwise, we wouldn't see so much of the market overpriced. Moving forward through next year, and again, it's really hard to forecast beyond. Um, are you seeing anything else that you think people need to be aware of? Anything that you need to warn buyers and sellers out there in the market that they need to be conscious of? I, I, I think basically this year, 2024, again, giving it election, giving that this is kind of a pause year of interest rates or stabilizing starting decline. I think what I would be, uh, I guess, careful of, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a true buyer and you're really looking for a great deal, I mean, this is, this is a time where you can actually take advantage of other people looking and being hesitant to just pull the trigger if you find the right product at yeah. a fair price. Uh, I think if you're going to be waiting too long, you're going to be basically either price of the market or you're just going to have to pay more. And that is not wise. I mean, waiting for, the, for the, whatever it is you want to happen, if you're waiting, for example, the interest to come down and then, you, okay, I'm going to buy then, you know, at that time when it happens, it's too late. Um, or, or waiting for, you know, after the election or whatever is the trigger, you, you don't want to be caught in this situation where you waited for what everybody else is waiting for and then try to compete. Um, uh, in terms of uh, sellers, uh, you know, you can, you can fish the market and, that, and that's fine. Uh, realizing that, you know, there's, there's times where people are acting irrationally and they would pay any price. I don't think this is the time uh, for that because, again, 
A lot of people are very, you know, in fatigue of the price increases. They still need to adjust. Um, sellers that, that want to sell, you know, like always, you know, of course you need to make sure that, you know, the, the home is ready to sell, et cetera, but also pricing it uh, in line with what recent transactions, not what yeah. you see other uh, listings are for. Because like you said just recently, it's very true. Listing prices versus transaction prices may be very different because a lot of those listings will have adjustment. It's simply people that don't want to or don't need to sell. Uh, you can use it as a guidance. Use the guidance as what sold recently and making your own adjustment compared to you know, what is now available in the market and price accordingly. It's very important. Uh, well, I got one final question, which comes into um, the condo market, the older condos on the beach. And this situation right now, and again, there was an article that came up in Biz News, which shows there is, uh, you know, aggressive plays being made for these older condos by um, big developers who are wanting to come in and buy up these, um, these older condos because they see that there's extreme financial pressure on those residents with very high HOA fees, um, rising costs, big assessments coming, and other variables. What is... What is your observation of how it's going to play out for these older condo owners? Do you think that they are playing a dangerous game with, with, with holding off, or do you think they have good cause to kind of push back? How do you see this whole market playing out? I mean, this whole old condo market seems like there, there was a statistic, it's 2,400 old condos right now that are coming up for their 40-year assessment. Yeah. Across this, this, is, this is a market, and, and you need to be aware if you live in one of those older uh, buildings, that if you live in an older building that is about to get to this 40-year certification, and if the building does not have a you know garage, so meaning that the building is sitting on whatever piece of land and next to it there is a parking lot, those are very attractive for developers to bid on those yeah. buildings because basically there's a big piece of land that is underutilized, and they're saying, well, we can buy this building at whatever cost, build there something bigger, maybe two towers, and it's worth the investment. And they're going to do it in one of two ways. They're either just going to go to the association and say, hey, you know, you're 38, 39 years old, uh, you know, 40 years certification coming soon. Here's a price. Your market price is X. We're going to give you 20, 30, 40, 50% more. Depends on the situation. Uh, please get out. Uh, that's the first, the first approach. And, and it's very difficult to do that because they need 95% of the people approving plus ones, over 95%. Uh, and it's, it's in many of those cases, there's just a few people that are resisting for whatever reasons, good reason, not good reasons, make it very difficult to do. Uh, so they try it, it, success rate is not very high. The other approach is basically doing some kind of a wholesale takeover. They're gonna go and buy enough units within the building uh, mm -hmm. Take control over the board, take control over the, the management, basically, and then increase HOAs, do things that basically scare the rest of the, the people uh, away. Uh, so you can call it a hostile takeover in some way, but think about it. If you have enough control of a building and they say, well, HOA now is not going to be 500, it's going to be 1,200. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to scare enough people away, they're going to be selling, then they can get even more control. And then basically to get this 95%, um, it's easier. So... Um, depends how much value there is in the building. So yeah. again, bigger parking lot, closer to the ocean, you're in a big risk of some development group uh, is going to basically be. So again, the first one is the, the nice way of, okay, I can profit from that because my unit is worth 500 and they give me 750. So I'll take this and, uh, and move out and, and that's an opportunity. Uh, but the other approach is, is a little bit more risky. Um, yeah. And you need to think about, you know, am I able to... Uh, sustain increase in HOA or any kind of also take over what it means for me. Yeah, there's the, I, there, there is a belief that, that, that people can only handle that pain for so long because inflation in Miami is very real. Um, it's particularly higher than it is that people would perceive in the rest of the country. Um, more importantly, the people who are living, a large majority of those in these buildings are retired. They're not earning, so they're literally li living off their savings. And when this happens, that pressure mounts in many, many ways. Um, this will make it interesting to see those buildings, see who buys up those buildings. And for those people who live in buildings next door, so those newer buildings, those more modern buildings that you're buying into, if you're in one of those buildings right now, maybe look out your window, see if there's an old building next to you with a very large parking lot area, because there's a good chance that that building's being targeted. And when that happens, 
you know, developments come. We know there's pent-up demand. We know there's money in the system. We know there's opportunity to be had. We know the dollar per square foot that are selling on the beach for new construction are at new record highs. There was something that came out only a few days ago um, that talked about the Shore Club's penthouse for 120 million, which is staggering. So over the next five years, seeing where we're going, it's fair to say that a lot of that product will get purchased. Um, we'll, we'll obviously certainly have eyes on it to get purchased. And if you're in a newer building in those areas, um, you've got to be aware now more than ever of what's going to be happening in the next couple of years um, around you. So, um, Elias, it's always an interesting conversation with you. Thank you really appreciate it. Um, a lot of our data you'll get attached to this podcast. You can go on, read the blog attached to it. This is always a continued conversation. Of course. It never stops. We're always learning. Um, there's no finish line in this. Um, but I want to thank you, as always. If you want to know more, see Ellie's information below. My, obviously, information below, as always. Um, we're always on hand to teach the market and, and learn from each other and, and anyone out there that wants to come in and chime in and DM us and ask us a question. For the next time that we do this, and there will be a next time, we invite anyone that has a question that they really want answering, ask that question because we may add it into the podcast. We may add it into the article because we want to make sure and hear from you guys to know what you want to know what's going on and asking. Ellie, thank you again. Thank really you, appreciate David. it. I appreciate it.